Hey guys, I'm back with uh, my round 5 game from the 2019 Gibraltar Masters Tournament. Um, here I was paired with Grandmaster Renier Vasquez de Garza, a Spanish Grandmaster. Um, quite a strong player, he's rated in like the 2560s right now, but he's been, I feel like 2580 and higher for, for quite a while. Um, so yeah, I was playing black, and he's mainly a d4 player, so once again, I was basically expecting a King's Indian, and, um, one of my, so one of my favorite things about playing in Gibraltar is, you know, it's like one, one round a day, uh, the round is always at 3 p.m., and the pairings are always up the night before, so both players get tons of time to prepare, and during the preparation, you know, I probably learned a lot, because I spend a couple hours per player just looking at a bunch of different lines, um, but when you're playing the King's Indian exclusively, I, I don't really play anything else. I mean, at least not according to my database. Um, you know, you have like this target on your back. So every day I'm like walking in just like <laughs> wondering, you know, what's it going to be this time? Where are they going to try and, uh, and refute the, the King's Indian today? Um, so he went for knight c3, bishop g7, and I was now expecting like a classical line with e4. Uh, but then he played g3. Which wasn't too big of a surprise because uh, he has played this uh, quite recently, so uh, this was one of the lines I was preparing for. Uh, so I castled bishop g2, d6. And here the main move is knight f3, this is the main thing I was preparing, um, but instead he played e4. Which is a, a known sideline, but I don't believe he's played this before, at least not in the database, so I hadn't looked at it in a while. Um, actually, I the only reason I knew anything about this line was because I covered it uh, in a video for um, my Patreon page, one of the opening labs, uh, where someone asked a question about what should black do here, and, and then I researched it and looked it up. Um, so that was back in, I think, like November or October. Uh, so when E4 showed up on the board, <laughs> I was like immediately trying to think back to what I had covered in the video. Uh, and I actually, it, it helped me out, because I remembered uh, an important trick in this line. Um, so I played e5, this is the main move, and knight g2. So this is kind of White's idea, he's just trying to get a huge space advantage. I think black has different ways of playing here, but I remember the main way is to uh, play knight c6. Uh, just putting pressure on the center, White usually has to push d5 here, and then knight d4. So I'm seemingly sacrificing a pawn, but it's a nice tactical trick that is really important for King's Indian players. I have knight takes e4 because white's king hasn't castled yet, and queen takes e4, rook e8, just wins the game. So, because of this uh, tactic, white can't take on d4 yet, so instead he just castles. Um, and here was an interesting moment. So I, I knew the line, or the main move, was uh, to play c5 here. And this one actually leads to a a real, let's say, temporary pawn sacrifice, where white takes on c6, black takes back with the pawn, now white can take on d4, and take this pawn, but black gets some counterplay with knight g4, and the queen is attacked and has to move. Um, I think I was mainly looking at um, queen d3 here, at least I was trying to recall the theory uh, during the game, and I remembered something like this, knight e5, Queen e2, bishop e6, um, hitting the c4 pawn, white is forced to play b3, and now black finally wins the pawn back with knight takes c4, b takes c4, and bishop takes c3. So I was pretty sure this is what I covered in the uh, the Patreon video when I was researching what black should do here, but I couldn't remember the evaluation of this position, like whether it was uh, equal or close to equal, or maybe white was slightly better, but it's playable. Um, and more importantly, you know, I really had no idea how deeply my opponent prepared this line. So at the board, you know, I was trying to think, like, should I go for this? It's kind of a sharp theoretical line. You know, if he knows some ideas here that I don't, which probably he does because he prepared this himself, then, uh, you know, I could be in big trouble right out of the opening. So I didn't really want to do that. It, it just seemed like kind of a losing play to go for a line that you know your opponent has prepped much better than you have and, um, you're not really sure, you know, like, if I was confident that it was equal and, and black is holding, then I would go for it, but I felt like maybe white might be getting, like, a small plus there, so uh, I'm not sure if I was, like, ready to play it. I think it ended up being a good decision uh, not to play it <laughs> for, for a couple of reasons. Um, I ended up going with knight takes e2 here, 
And this was kind of an over-the-board improvisation just based on trying to get a playable King's Indian position. Um, and after Queen takes e2, I play the move Knight to d7. Um, so yeah, during the game, this kind of made sense to me. I want to play f5, and um, I put my Knight on d7 and not any other square because I feel like it's quite naturally going to be posted on c5, supported with a5, and, and that just looks like a great development scheme. Um, so after the game, I checked like the theory, and it was definitely a good, um, a good thing that I didn't go for the line because I remembered most of it correctly, but but not all of it. So here, for instance, White's main move is Queen d1, not Queen d3. Uh, and then after Knight e5, we do get this line with b3. Uh, knight takes c4, takes Bishop takes e3. It's a little bit different, um, but there is some theory here. And my memory was partly correct, like black is okay if you play like a computer and if you like have good prep here, but if I was on my own, like after rook e8, rook c1, uh, I'm not sure I would have found the, the right ideas here. Um, and also queen d1 is not the only move in, in the position for white, apparently queen d2 is a move here. Um, the point being after knight e5, white can play b3, and now I don't have knight takes c4, so I don't win the pawn back immediately. Um, and yeah, I basically have, <laughs> you know, I have no idea whether black is getting enough compensation for the pawn here or not. You know, during the game, it would have been, it would have been tough to figure all this out. So I'm quite happy that I went for, um, a position that I thought was playable and flexible enough. Um, and I was confident enough in my, you know, King's Indian abilities to kind of play this middle game properly. Um, yeah, so knight e7, white plays bishop e3. Uh, and then I played a5, which I think is a, a pretty decent idea. And actually, interestingly enough, you know, I feel like this game might even be theoretically relevant because from what I understand, at least looking at the theory, it seems like most players who go for this line will play c5 and go for this line, where I feel like black is kind of on the verge of, of being worse or just ending up a pawn down. But knight takes e2 and knight d7, it, uh, I think it's been played, but very, very rarely, I mean, and, and not by any strong players. Um, but I feel like it gives black a, a very healthy, like, King's Indian type of middle game um, and, and a much more fluid play, and you don't have to sacrifice a pawn. So I feel like this this is kind of uh, an improvement over what is kind of considered the main line. Um, okay, so bishop e3, a5, and here white played a3. And it's actually an interesting moment because at first this move looks a little bit incorrect because black can play a4 and fix the queen side. This is normally good. But the problem is white will play queen c2 here and simply gang up on the pawn. Uh, and if I play knight c5, white will give up the bishop and take on a4. Now sometimes black can sacrifice a pawn in this way and just take the dark squared bishop, but here it, it feels like a little bit too much and, and black really isn't getting enough, uh, I think, for the, for the pawn. So um, instead, after some thought, I decided to play uh, b6. Uh, and then white pushes b4, so he's getting his main counterplay going, or his main play going, and I'm getting my counterplay with f5. Uh, and now typically in these positions, white would like to play e takes f5, g takes f5, and f4 to kind of fix the structure, but the problem here is that the knight on c3 is hanging, so black can take on f4, and uh, white is losing material, too many things under attack. So f5, he instead played f3, which I think is... Uh, also quite natural. I pushed f4, bishop f2, and h5. And at this point, you know, I wasn't really sure about the evaluation of the position. It just seemed like black is getting some play, and my plan is pretty natural. I want to play g5 and uh, bring my knight to f6 and eventually break with g4 and just try to create some, some holes on the, on the king side. Um, here I was a little bit concerned about the move bishop h3, because it's a typical idea for white to try and trade the light squared bishops. But even after these bishops trade off, um, black's queen shows up on c8, and then I'm threatening to jump into h3. And then, um, actually we discussed this after the game, if king g2, black has this nice move, knight h7 here. And I'm threatening to go like knight g5, and again, queen h3 check or taking on g3, and it's not fun for white, you know, the, as my opponent said, like, the bishop on g2 is a bad bishop, but it is defending the king, so it is quite important in this position for white. Um, another interesting idea is that had white taken on f4 here, 
Um, I was calculating this during the game. I could recapture e takes f4, but I think also really interesting is just the immediate move knight h7. Kind of a typical pawn sacrifice. So I'm inviting white to take another pawn on e5. I think this would be a pretty serious mistake because bishop takes e5. My bishop gets in, my queen is coming in, you know, knight again is coming to g5. My rook is opened up and like, yeah, black just has a tremendous attack. So yeah, I agree. I think that would have been too dangerous for white. Uh, instead he goes for knight b5, so he's improving the knight, he's getting ready to eventually break with c5. I put a g5 uh, and rook a c1. Okay, so now white is, again, just wanting to play c5 very soon. But um, yeah, this is actually a really interesting moment, because I, I wasn't quite sure what to do here. It's always a tough one in the King's Indian, because the most natural move to follow my plan is to play knight f6 and then g4 and, and we're good. Um, but the knight is also really useful controlling the c5 square and right now it's not even clear if white is threatening to go c5, at least during the game I wasn't sure. So I was really considering this move rook f7 for example, which is a very like thematic King's Indian move. Um, defending the c7 pawn in advance, preparing a move like bishop f8, and then swinging the rook to g7 to help the attack. Uh, and here I was trying to figure this out. So if white just plays c5 immediately, uh, I take, take, let's say I take with the knight and I force white to give up the bishop if he wants to break through. And the problem is white does break through, but he gives up the dark sword bishop. So I can take on g3 here, for example, h takes g3, uh, and then play a move like h4. And white is having a trouble on the dark squares. I think g4 seems like a possible move. And then, for example, bishop f8, just using the square for my bishop. Now my bishop gets this nice diagonal. Um, and yeah, I feel like black is doing very well here because, okay, my structure is quite weak, like all my pawns are, are bad, but white's bishop on g2 is really, really passive and the dark sword bishop is quite strong. So yeah, during the game, I really wasn't sure about this position. It's only like a analyzing afterwards with Stockfish. I kind of was convinced that black is doing well here. So yeah, this rook f7 move I, I think was definitely the, the way to go here for black because I actually don't think he would have played c5 here um, because it, it seemed like he didn't want to while my knight was on d7. But if white doesn't play c5, it's not clear what move he makes because, um, well, <laughs> this is his main break in the position and there doesn't seem to be a way for him to build up so easily. Maybe rook c2 and then doubling on the c file um, but then I imagine black has time to just continue my own regrouping with bishop f8, and it just feels like black's moves are going to be um, like easier to make on the king side, because I just have rook g7 next, and then again g4, and uh, I feel like eventually maybe h4, and I <laughs> should be able to break through. And from white's point of view, once my bishop shows up on f8, now it's very hard to get c5 in, even with the second rook on c1, because uh, I'm just going to have so much protection over the square. So yeah, I feel like during the game, I um, well, I ended up going for a takes b4, uh, opening the a file, a takes b4, and then knight f6. And I had a very clear idea in mind here. And, and what I did is not bad. I think it just wasn't uh, wasn't the best. I think what ends up happening in the game is black gets uh, a pretty safe and, and holdable position. Um, with rook f7, I think I might even start fighting for the advantage. At least, according to Stockfish, you know, black is already looking good, which is a lot because Stockfish really, really hates the King's Indian. <laughs> I mean, every position, it feels like it, the fact that this, the position isn't evaluated at like plus one is kind of a miracle. Oh, whoops. Um, so I'll show you what I did. I played a takes b4, a takes b4, uh, and knight f6. And I'm basically allowing c5 with the idea, uh, feeling that like white isn't actually achieving that much there, and I should just get my play going with g4. Um, so c5, I take on c5, b takes c5, uh, and bishop a6. I think this is kind of an important idea. I slow white down quite a bit uh, because of this pin. He definitely has to react to this because rook b8 is coming. Uh, and he played rook a1, which I felt like was, was the best move. Now, if I'm not careful, um, white is potentially threatening to take on a6. And then after rook takes a6, he can take on c7. And I think he's doing well there. Um, but first I threw in f takes g3, h takes g3. 
and my idea was actually just to take on b5. So I'm giving up the important light squared bishop, but the point was is that now, like, very soon we're going to get c takes d6 in the position, uh, and then c takes d6, and then all the play is just going to be centered on the king side, um, which means that white's two bishops are not going to be all that strong because my knight uh, is a good piece when the action is kind of localized on one side of the board. Not to mention I also have this break with g4 coming, which is going to be really nice for my knight coming to g4. So bishop takes b5, queen takes b5, uh, I trade rooks, and I felt like trading pieces here is actually slightly in black's favor because now all my pieces that are left are on the king side. My bishop on g7 is passive, but so is white's light squared bishop. Both of these bishops are doing a nice defensive job, um, but my knight here is a very, very annoying piece, especially after g4. And I've definitely seen some Hikaru Nakamura games where it seems like he's kind of worse the whole game, like slightly worse, but eventually the position simplifies. Um, here c takes d6, c takes d6 was played, and then he ends up with this kind of weird like late middle game type of position where his knight can do a lot of damage on the king side. So actually already here I was feeling uh, extremely comfortable, and I felt like black uh, is probably not, not worse anymore. Um, not that I was much worse earlier, but, you know, you never know in the King's Indian. Um, so here white plays rook a7. I think this move is pushing it a little bit because already I, I think white should actually be thinking about making sure to equalize here, but uh, it's still it's still fine. Uh, I took on f3. Now there was an interesting moment here because um, white does not have to recapture right away. He has some other options. Actually, the engine thinks bishop h3 here is quite playable. During the game, I was a little bit concerned about this move, queen b7, uh, threatening the mate on g7, but I have this nice resource with knight e8. And I cover the bishop, everything looks super passive, but I did just take a pawn on f3, and now I'm defending the pawn with my rook. So <laughs> this is now an extra pawn. Uh, and after a move like bishop h3, white doesn't actually have any threats here. So I can play queen g5, and I'm threatening to potentially give this check. I'm threatening h4 and to take on g3 and black is just doing very well. I think white is in big trouble. So after some thought, he eventually recaptured on f3, uh, and I played this move knight g4. And yeah, I think black is, is getting a uh, great counterplay here. Okay, now both of his bishops are hanging, um, and he has to decide whether he wants to give up the dark squared bishop or the light squared bishop. He took this way. I think this was a, a pretty safe choice. h takes g4 and uh, king g2. So there were definitely still ways for white to go wrong here. I set one little trick here with queen g5 uh, that he avoided, you know, easily. <laughs> but, you know, other players uh, might not have been uh, so so lucky. Um, well, it seems like queen d7 here would be quite tempting for white. But after queen d7, black would have this move, queen f6. And everything is defended, but the bishop on f2 is hanging, queen f3 check is hanging. White is kind of forced to play queen e6. Then black can take, take, and play rook e8, and I'm going to be picking up this pawn. Um, now, Stockfish thinks even this endgame is like nothing for black, <laughs> and white can draw with precise play, but, you know, an extra pawn would, would definitely be annoying uh, to face, so I was kind of hoping to, to be able to get this endgame. But, okay, of course my opponent did not blunder, and just played the much more solid uh, queen e2. And I was trying to figure out if I could put any pressure here, because I realized, okay, I'm not worse at all. My g4 pawn is strong. I can put my rook in on f3 at any point, and it appears active, but I'm really not getting much here uh, with black. I, I have, like, queen h5 and queen h3, but it's just one check. The king goes back to g1, and it's, uh, it's no big deal. I ended up playing rook b8. I just figured, okay, if he lets me play rook b1, then things could be dangerous. So he, of course, plays rook a1. Uh, and here I realize I just have nothing, so I don't, don't really do anything. I just try not to mess up my position. I put my queen on g6. He played queen c2. I played queen f6, seeing if he'll let me play queen f3 check. He went back, and uh, we just found this like natural repetition, uh, and the game was agreed drawn here. Um, so, yeah, I f felt like this was a really solid game. I I I'm quite happy with this one. Um, you know, I was caught in the opening. I was definitely surprised by the line, but I found I found something that was not only playable, but I think is theoretically like quite good. And uh, and then yeah, after the game we talked a bit. He said it was a correct game. 
which I thought was a uh, nice praise because <laughs> my games are usually far from correct and, and filled with like blunders and mistakes but everything was like quite logical and it was like um, all the way until the end stayed very very balanced you know neither side had a chance for like a huge advantage at any point just maybe small initiative here and there um, so yeah now I'm on three out of five uh, the tournament is halfway done so five more rounds uh, I haven't checked the pairings yet for tomorrow, but I'm pretty sure they're already out. Um, so, yeah, I'll have to get to preparing soon. Um, thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.